in here uh, this afternoon. And we've called the uh, chair of uh, efforts to sort of economically <coughs> work together in this region. And I believe uh, the blue economy is probably the most uh, opportune moment <coughs> for the region to sort of come together. Because the land-based resources and the land-based economy has not really uh, had much traction <coughs> for lots of reasons. But this is a new frontier. And in this new frontier, I think we do have an opportunity to share the benefits <coughs> of the way of paying all resources. So with that said, let me say I first thank Dr. Mihai Nayak and his colleagues here at the uh, Defense Studies and Analysis Institute for inviting me to provide a Sri Lankan perspective on the topic of sharing the Bay of Bengal resources. As you probably know, uh, your Prime Minister and also the Bangladesh uh, leader and our Prime Minister have been at the forefront of promoting and championing the blue economy uh, ever since the uh, SDG 14th goal was identified as the, the with the emphasis on ocean resources, there's been a groundswell of interest in, in identifying what this blue economic opportunity is. And of course, one can include or exclude, like the United States have done, the coastal economy from the ocean economy. Of course, this part of the world, we seem to have included both the coastal economy and the ocean economy as one and lump it together. And in that context, uh, Boston Consultancy Group, I mean, everybody wants evaluation, what is the size of the uh, blue economy. I would say this is the Boston Consultancy Group's uh, estimation. They believe it's about 24 trillion. This is a number that's been bandied by a lot. But uh, they themselves admit that this is an underrated, understated number because it's substantially higher than this number. I mean, the global economy is what, $220 trillion? Can't be that uh, the, the, the blue economy is stuck at 24. I mean, there's already about $24 trillion allocated for, for climate change and for green investments that is un underinvested. So this has to be a bigger <coughs> number. Given the, the questions that one could raise about that number, I'm not going to venture out and put my foot in to estimate what is the Bay of Bengal's value of the blue economy. But I believe that in itself is a number that is up to researchers and for the business community to design and develop. I know FIKI uh, in your country try to estimate the value of the economy. We tried ourselves in Sri Lanka and I must confess that given the uh, dimensions of the type of technologies that are emerging, to exploit the resource and blue economy, uh, the numbers are anything um, that you and I can guess. So given the wide latitude in the number of economic sectors one can include or exclude the margins of error <coughs> by actually looking at some of the known traditional uh, economic activities that we all rely on the oceans. But for my talk today, I do not want to focus on the traditional, I want to sort of go and think outside of the box and see, okay, here's the Bay of Bengal, this is a uh, New Zealand rendition of the Bay of Bengal based on black metric data um, that we have collected for our Sri Lanka sufficient for the continent shelf margin claim, sort of accurate I believe with the happiness amount Seamount and the 90s East Ridge showing on that depiction. There's a substantial amount of resources sitting in this bay. Now, as you already know, the leaders of our countries are very focused on the blue economy and for a good reason. Because they themselves know there's a very vast repository of sediments that could derive energy resources which and many other resources for the benefit of the large population that your country has and this whole region as a whole has and the emerging middle class has very substantial 
aspirations for a lifestyle created in the middle class, and consequently, the type of products, services, goods that needs to be produced requires the elements and the raw materials that we can harvest from the blue economy. So, if you take that, we are very lucky, and I believe uh, the good professor from the Himalayan Institute will be enlightening us later on the Himalayan opportunities, but I think as he would uh, probably explain to you how the Himalayas got created, there is also an opportunity for us to understand that the Gurmala land is where we all originate from. And it is because of that origin that the Bay of Bengal, the Bengal fan, is endowed with all of these sediments. And some of the sediments in the Bengal fan is very, very thick, up to 20 kilometers in thickness in the northern part of the Bengal fan. And that is because the Brahmaputra rivers and all the rivers that have been bringing down those sediment loads from the Himalayas have deposited that and it runs further south of Sri Lanka, uh, past the equator, uh, right down to a grain of sand. So it's a very substantial chunk of hydrocarbon that is sitting there in the Bay of Bengal and is the largest. And the only thing is, I mean, we all have been looking at how to exploit this resource and the reason why one has only exploited resources within the 200 nautical mile EZ of the country is because that's a narrow shelf on the right hand side, it's a white shelf on the west coast of India. It's fairly accessible, it's not very deep portions. But once you get to the middle of the Bay of Bengal, it's a fairly deep portion and 4,000 meters, 3,000 meters. And consequently, the, the price point for oil barrel has to probably breach $100 or more for it to be economically viable to exploit this particular resource space. So that's something to think about, that the, the real value of the blue economy in the Bay of Bengal is going to be dependent on the price of oil and gas, because that's how the bulk of the resource that lies in the center of the Bay of Bengal is going to come out of the ground. And that's something to keep our minds close to. But there's a bigger opportunity that all the nations have been looking at, and that is the continental shelf beyond the 200 nautical mile EZ. And this is the area that I want to sort of emphasize, because as you can see the orange on the screen there, it's a very substantial area that the coastal states in the Bay of Bengal are entitled to claim. And fortunately, Sri Lanka and India collaborated at the time when we drafted the Law of the Sea on clause in the 70s under late Ambassador Shirley Amar Singh, who chaired, there was the president of the conference. And I believe at that time, an anomaly was found that the most of the countries led by Ireland, who were advocating for resources to be allocated beyond a 200 nautical mile jurisdiction, they found that Sri Lanka and southern part of India, we have a very narrow shelf. So geomorphologically, you have the coastline just dropping deep down to the sea bottom, three, 4,000 meters very quickly. And because of that, we don't have an opportunity to sort of claim the seabed using the natural prolongation uh, principles that the UNCLOS Convention had negotiated over the years. And so there was an exception that was negotiated, which was called the Statement of Understanding, which Sri Lanka led at the time. And so both India and Sri Lanka was given an exception to the standard unclosed provisions to claim the resources in the Bay of Bengal. Of course, they couldn't name Sri Lanka and India in a convention uh, that is signed by and ratified by everyone. So they put it in the UNCLOS Convention that states in the southern part of the Bay of Bengal is entitled to use an exceptional method to claim the resource in the Bay of Bengal. I think this is kind of important that uh, we are tied at the hip with respect to this particular asset. And as much as Sri Lanka has entitlement to a large portion of that asset, we are very well uh, realized that our closest neighbor has a much larger population size and a greater demand for resources so therefore, there will come a time when we need to think about 
shared resources on all that area. And there have been, as you know, the conflict in Iran began with the Kuwaiti infraction of mining the hydrocarbons under Kuwait, and they said it was a mining activity that drew down hydrocarbon reservoirs from Iran's territory. I don't believe that we will get into such issues here, but I think the fact is there are plenty of shared mechanisms globally wherever there is an overlapping area of entitlement, then there is a way in which you can have a, uh, a joint conference established to take care of those resources, either by selling it to the highest bidder and then splitting the revenue, or having allocation of that resource to the country that you're partnering with. But I think it's important that we do not turn this area into another Persian Gulf type conflict zone just because of the demand. I mean, I'll go back to those two slides that I was trying to, I fell through. Because of the way in which these economies are driving, as you can see, China and India, you're, you'll be raising ahead of the United States and many of the established economies. So therefore, the demand for energy by both of you is going to be substantial. And that demand is the reason why we have uh, external interest in the Indian Ocean, as much as there are external interest in the Persian Gulf. And I think we need to work out arrangements quite early to ensure that these resources that's in our neighborhood is there for the countries in the neighborhood first. And excess can be shared elsewhere. Subject to the price point of that resource is paid to a global market price. So I think in, in, in looking at the resources and the, the demand for energy, we realize that the Bay of Bengal resource base need to be identified for its energy potential first. Because the energy assets that the Bay of Bengal has goes beyond gas hydrates, gas and petroleum. We have, as I said earlier, because of the way in which Sri Lanka and India has evolved in this area. We have a substantial amount of shipping lanes that are passing south of Sri Lanka and there is the proposal to develop the Kra Canal in, in the southern part of Myanmar and Thailand's uh, narrow point. And if that were to evolve, then clearly the Andaman Islands but the port and the eastern seaboard of India is going to be substantially attractive for many of the larger vessels that are crossing from the China Sea. Of course, that has an implication for, for Singapore because the Malacca Straits three-day sailing may be avoided. But again, to develop this Bay of Bengal blue economy potential, <coughs> the Kra Canal may well be an initiative that the countries should get together to perhaps push along with our partners in the South China Sea because it's a huge saving on fossil fuels that it's expended for the vessels that have to do the Malacca Straits route and clearly it's going to be something I think will come into fruition depending on the participation of Singapore in the future. Equally the Logistics of the ports, which we all know, is, is tied to the blue economy. It, what is more relevant is the railway links and the logistics transportation infrastructure that would need to get built between the ports and interconnected into the hinterland and to the landlocked countries further up on the South Asian continent. So, in that respect, there is substantial investment opportunities to link the logistics <coughs> sector and again many countries that are depending on gas delivery are depending on electricity delivery particularly Bangladesh and countries that are looking at some of the hydro reservoir electricity generation that's coming from Nepal and Bhutan there is a substantial opportunity to develop high tension electricity transmission lines that are based on superconductivity and to develop superconductivity transmission lines you need resources that is lying idle 
in the Bay of Bengal. We have ilmenite, we have thorium, we have monocytes, we have mica. I mean, if you look at some of the heavy metals, the rare earths that the Bay of Bengal is sitting on, it's considerable the value potential of all of these resources that actually would endanger a, a high-tech industrial corridor that the countries can collaborate and partner with. Earlier on in the morning today, we heard about the need for scientific diplomacy. I mean, clearly, the research and development and the opportunity to partner between the countries is where the unity will get forged. It's not about dominating the neighboring countries by developing the technology for yourselves and keeping it exclusively for yourself, but it is working on a partnership basis to develop all of these resources that are lying in the Bay of Bengal. And I think it's important <coughs> that that concept is understood. Like the United States of America has attracted all of the immigrants into their country over the years from different parts of the world to bring the brain trust together to develop their technological advantage. I think we here in the Bay of Bengal have the opportunity based on the rare earths that the southern part of the Bay of Bengal has and many other resources that we have that we can start developing the technological priority and advantage and the value chain where we can actually get into the final end product production not just for the consumption and use of our countries but also for the export markets globally. So this economy has to be thought through and we should not make the mistakes of what the EU had done in the way they looked at the structures. We really need to relook at how we bring the higher education institutions, the research organizations, and all of the government entities that are involved in high end R&D together in the region for us to develop a close partnership. And I think titanium is something that we all have. And again, in the ocean economy, we need to do substantial wind offshore wind power potential that we need to house, harness Sri Lanka and India in the, not on the Bay of Bengal, but certainly on the side of the Mana Basin. We have about 50,000 megawatts of wind power. So clearly, India's energy needs are what? You can import nearly 97% of your energy requirements over the years as your development trajectory matures, which means you need access to energy and the region can provide you that energy. So we need to build the transmission lines, we need to build the underwater sea cable connectivity and then we need to invest in developing the energy generating opportunities in the ocean. But that does not mean that you come and dominate the investment of those opportunities in the countries. You leave some gravy on the table for those who don't, cannot afford those investments and make sure that the other economies can come up with you as, as, as your energy supply partner. And of course, the salt industry, I mean, it's unprecedented what this Bay of Bengal preachers are, if you really think about it. If you think about the robotics and where things are going in terms of the world, all of the components that go into that, the raw materials we possess in the Bay of Bengal. We need to think about Hyperloop. U.S. is thinking about it, they're doing it. Your country is thinking about it. We need global interconnectivity between our countries with technologies of this nature. Again, maglev technologies come into play. All of the raw materials back again can be harvested from within. Biotechnology clearly is a huge area with such a large population with pandemics and all of the issues developing the pharmaceutical capacity is going to be important, and we have most of it, and partly because there's a tri-junction and there's some uh, level of uh, subvents that are taking place in the ocean bottom, and researchers are finding a lot of material that they can produce new medicines with from the ocean floor. Similarly, the data cable traffic, I mean, they're saying e-cables, I mean, we have a very substantial number of uh, data traffic cables that are connecting the region. And again, this is an opportunity for us to develop. Transportation clearly is another area. And of course, with all of those opportunities, there's also the risk and the vulnerability that we've got to think about. So 
So while thinking about shared resources, of sharing the resource and the opportunity, we need to share the responsibility to deal with the vulnerability. <coughs> and that vulnerability and identifying that vulnerability and identifying the risk is going to be very, very important. And in UNDEC, and we have spoken about some of the aspects of climate change and the anthropogenic activities of most of us in the industries that we are involved in and in our desire to develop, we sort of ignore the emissions and some of the detrimental act actions of the negative impacts that is taking place. And that negative impact is more importantly impacting the oceans more than the land because ocean acidification is killing the reefs, killing the planktons, and nearly 80% of our oxygen that we breathe comes from the ocean planktons, and we can't kill that, we can't kill the reefs, we can't kill the spawning grounds of the fish stocks that provide bulk of the protein for our people. So we need to think about our actions. We can't be selfish. We've had this situation in Sri Lanka, 30 years war, the northern part of the Kauri Basin in between India and South India, and the Mana Basin was a no fishing zone. It's almost like a marine res reserve that was declared. Not intentionally, but it became so. And we had substantial fish stocks. Soon after the war was over, the fishing fleets from South India started bottom trawling, and the whole thing is almost destroyed now. <laughs> so every time we bring this matter up with our counterparts, it's, it's viewed sometimes as a complaint. But what we are saying is, hey, this is our shared stock. Fish swim everywhere. Preserve it. So we need to think about not just across the board that Sri Lanka is. No, it is all of us because the ocean has no boundary. There are no walls. We share the resource together. So we need to think about things in a shared concept, not in a selfish, self-centered way. And that's something that we need to do. And sea level rise. I mean, clearly, Sri Lanka is vulnerable. Jaffna, Batiklo, Colombo, Mana, Hambantota, practically the whole island in the coast, as much as uh, Bangladesh is vulnerable and parts of South India and other parts of India is vulnerable. We are vulnerable. So what does it mean? It's an opportunity to look at the type of coastal city infrastructure that gets designed and built. And how do we share best practices? We need to change the <coughs> utilities that are being laid out on those city, uh, vulnerable cities, and we need to shift the way the utilities are being designed. So there's a whole lot of opportunities, best practices that the region can develop, and we need to proactively act to basically prevent a massive internal migration of people in our countries because of sea level rise is going to take place. Similarly, the marine species, the decline of habitats is substantial with the example I gave you with the Kauri Basin. And again, I think we need to do a carrying capacity assessment of the fish stocks and the spawning grounds, what we have in the Bay of Bengal. Unless we do that, we would be shooting in the dark about the blue economy. And we need to, sure India is a large export of shrimp and some of the crustacean fish that goes out to the world, but it seems that it's being done without uh, a sustainability factor being brought in. And so there has to be the political will at the domestic level to deal with these issues in a way that it helps us all. Equally, we need to, I think the carrying capacity study needs to be communicated with the fishing community. Internal communication to our populations is an important thing if you're going to take advantage of the blue economy. It can't reside at the level of scientists and academia and with the, none of that knowledge getting transferred to the ignorant fishermen who do not understand the risks that they are actually spawning. The fact that in Sri Lanka, and I'm sure it's the same here, we had coral mining for purpose of house uh, production of the construction industry and destroyed reefs massively. Source points on land pollution. We have created so many industrial parks throughout the country, close to drinking water rivers and rivers that empty to the oceans into vulnerable marine areas, and we have destroyed it. So I think we need to have a greater awakening about some of the anthropogenic activities that are taking place, 
with our population and local politicians at the provincial level are completely uh, non-cooperative in trying to deal with it. And without their cooperation, I don't think we'll have a blue economy uh, in the future. So the choice, research and development. On the right hand side, on the left hand side, you have conflict over these resources. What is the choice that we would want? And we know there are other countries in the region who are equally hungry for the resources, that are vying for these same resources. How do we ensure that these resources are there for each other? I think it can be done by starting the research and development work together. And once we do that, it automatically gets locked, locked in for the benefit of those who have participated in that research effort. Otherwise, we'll be clearly, from a perspective of national investments in the GDP, Sri Lanka cannot protect its ocean resources on its own. And just as much other countries have been looking to the United States and others for protection, there has to be, I think, a greater consensus in the region to protect the resources that we commonly share. So with those thoughts, I would like to ask everyone here to think about the risk and vulnerabilities and also not be so blindly tied to a GDP, GNP economic metric to measure the success of your economy. Think about, because the oceans is about sustainability and ocean resources are not there to be exploited in the way that you have destroyed the land resources. We need to have a new way of thinking and the millennials can considerably think differently than our generation. Hopefully we have some hope because of them. But clearly we need to look at the human well-being index. We need to look at other metrics that will define whether we are a successful economy, whether we are a successful country to the extent that we have actually protected the ecological resources that the oceans provide and that it is one connected ecosystem, one ecosystem and not multiple ecosystems. So sustainable development goal number 14 and which anchors the oceans along with a number of other sustainable development goals is something that we have all pledged but it can't remain as a lip service at a UN forum. It needs to be something that the business community, the entrepreneur community, the local provincial political community and of course the national level politicians will strive to implement. Thank you.